I'm Cliff Lynch. Uh, um, I'm the director of CNI, and I'll be doing this session. Um, uh, the topic today is ebooks and what's going on in the um, you know increasingly bizarre world of ebooks. I'm sure that uh, um, you many of you have been seeing um, uh, some of the headlines that have been emerging. Um, uh, proposals from publishers that um, uh, they license ebooks to um, uh, libraries that simulate wear um, and actually wear out after 26 circulations, um, you, you know, which is one of the, the particularly um, uh, mind twisting ones that I, I, I've seen lately. Um, I should say that I've been watching the development of ebooks with considerable interest for a long time. Um, about 10 years ago, I wrote a long piece about where ebooks stood then and some of the things that I was watching for and thought might happen. Um, and then I sort of put that aside and, you know, uh, put it in the background and moved on to, um, to, to spend more time on a lot of other things. And uh, recently I've been kind of coming back to this topic after about a, a 10 year hiatus and it's been really interesting to look at um, what's proved out and what's not proved out. Um, one of the things, of course, that's quite striking between now and 10 years ago is that um, ebooks are no longer kind of a fringe thing for a few people who like to read electronically. Um, they are actually a major market force, and as I was uh, just discussing with a couple of folks here, um, they're a sufficiently major market force that when you, you look at some of the big sales channels like Amazon, they're, um, you know, they're, they're now a dominant factor over uh, hardcover books. They'll probably, in the not distant future, overtake sales of softcover books. Um, uh, they are a serious consideration in um, release strategies for high impact um, uh, popular fiction. You know, the question of do we release an electronic form concurrently with the hardcover print edition or, or do we do something else? Uh, there have been great controversies about pricing them. So they're, they're really um, no longer sort of a, a novelty. They are a very serious and real economic factor in the book industry. Now, um, I think you can look at ebooks, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back and define terms in just a second, um, from kind of three different prisms that are useful. One is um, to look at them as genres of communication, if you will, um, uh, ways that, um, that people communicate with other people, and to think about how the um, properties and characteristics of that communication have changed as we've seen it migrate from the affordances of print on paper to the affordances of various kinds of digital environments. A second way of looking at them, and it's a way that I don't think we look at them enough, um, is as cultural product, as important sort of permanent um, traces and records of our culture. And certainly that's one of the ways that libraries and especially research libraries look at books and, and look at many other parts of the cultural record and um, they build collections of them. They think about how we're going to um, uh, preserve them, for example. Um, that, that conversation is startlingly absent in the ebook world today with the exception of tiny little niches that, um, that uh, exist around university presses which are very close to the academy. When you move beyond there, um, uh, there's this sort of frightening silence about, um, uh, about uh, e-books as cultural products or cultural records. And um, uh, you know, one of, one of the um, things that, that's particularly difficult is that it seems like 
um, libraries are getting almost systematically shut out of that discussion. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that point, which is really important. The third prism is an economic prism, where we start talking about how this restructures the, um, the publishing industry broadly and um, uh, the role of authors, of publishers, of booksellers, of uh, other players in this world, and, and who wins and who loses economically. And that's an area I'll maybe say a few words about, but I'm not going to emphasize because um, there are endless people, you know, analyzing this every other day and announcing winners and losers. And of course, they're all announcing different ones. But um, uh, you know, this 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 just seems to be one of these areas that the um, the business press cannot get enough pages of of um, prognostication and hand wringing in about. Um, so. Let me let me you know start by by kind of defining ebooks broadly. I think of them as digital works that sit on some kind of platform. That platform can be a general purpose computer. It can be some kind of a reading device. Um, it um, it may be a very limited function device like a Kindle, which. Um, uh, you know, stays quite close, really, to the affordances of paper, at least the way um, it's been programmed right now. It may be something um, that, as I say, has all of the flexibility of a general purpose computer. Um, I want to be clear that when I talk of ebooks, though, I'm talking about the content that sits in these things, not the platform itself. Um, it's worth noting as far as the platform goes that we now see a much richer range of platforms in use. There are a number of um, things that really were designed to look and handle a lot like books, Kindles and Nooks and things like that. Uh, but now that we see the rise of, um, of um, tablets of various kinds, uh, iPads and things like that, we're seeing that class of devices as a platform for a lot of reading. Um, we're seeing more people than you might think, although as with everything here, data is um, hard to come by and there's a lot of anecdote. Um, uh, but there seems to be actually more reading on smartphones than you might think. Um, people are, are actually uh, going through not just um, short newspaper articles, but lengthy texts on uh, various kinds of smartphone devices with high quality screens. So that's evolved as another platform. Um, we've also seen for really sort of the first time in the last couple of years, the large scale rise of platform emulators so that you can um, run almost all of the platforms emulated on your PC. You can run many of them on uh, some of the smartphones or tablet devices. So there, there, there's this sort of strange um, uh, interoperability by emulation that's showing up. And one of the things that, that, that's worth noting about that limited interoperability is that the interoperability is less about reading the book because the experience of reading the book isn't all that different from one platform to another today. It's mostly about coping with different purchasing channels that want to be their own silos and all of the horrible DRM and stuff that comes with those purchasing channels. Um, uh, really, there's, there's very little functional distinction. It's mostly um, it's mostly about emulating all of the, the connect back to that. Um, one of the other things that I, I, I want to note is that um, I was very struck when I looked at this um, 10 years ago that we were misunderstanding what was going on with these platforms. Um, uh, we were thinking of them as equivalences to books rather than portable libraries. Um, the notion that, in fact, it wasn't that people would walk around with one book on their reading device, but they'd walk around with two or three hundred books on their reading device. And part of that argument um, 
I, I think um, was, was made by um, uh, building on the experience with music, where you literally find people now walking around with all the music they've ever bought or heard or been able to swipe from someplace um, on a single device, you know, and it would take them um, uh, three and a half years to just listen to all of the tunes on the device once. Um, so um, it, it's become even more than a portable library. It's become um, somebody's sort of comprehensive personal library of record. That doesn't seem to have happened yet, by and large, for books, in part perhaps because so many titles are still not available in electronic form. Whereas in music now, um, uh, particularly outside of classical music, there are really very few holdouts um, uh, um, that, that haven't moved into, um, in, into the digital environment. That's, how, that's really strikingly not true um, when, you look at the, um, when, when you look at the world of e-books. Uh, there are many, many high-profile popular authors who haven't gone there um, and don't seem to be in any big hurry to go there, although I was looking at a, um, a breathless um, newspaper story, I think this morning or yesterday, that J.K. Rowling's may break down and um, license out Harry Potter finally for, um, for e-book use. Um, so the personal library kind of issue, um, I, I think, has not really emerged that strongly yet. And that's one to pay attention to because I think that the kind of searching and organization that people expect as they really get portable, comprehensive personal libraries is going to be quite different and quite a bit more sophisticated than what they've settled for in the world of music. And I actually do say settled for in the world of music because um, really, uh, I think by most of the kind of objective measures we, um, we think about for retrieval systems, um, uh, the ability to organize large amounts of music on something like an iPod and navigate it is, is pretty limited. Um, so those are, those are just a couple of kind of framing things by way of, um, by way of uh, um, defining terms. Let me say a few words about sort of where we are intellectually with e-books as, as modes of communication. Um, it's very interesting to look at what's happened with the scientific journal. And I believe Chris made this point yesterday. Um, uh, um, the, uh, and uh, I guess made it a little more forcefully than I would have. Um, she put up the, uh, a journal from the 17th century and a modern journal and suggested that a modern um, scholar would be pretty comfortable with the 17th century one. I actually think they'd grumble a little bit about the weird fonts, but um, uh, modulo that, you know, if you just sort of look structurally, and certainly if you, if you just do a hundred year window, um, they're absolute, you know, there's, there's absolutely no intellectual distance there. Now, I, I, I think part of the, the reason that that's persisted is that we are just finally now coming out of the period where we were doing dual print and digital um, uh, production of journals. I mean, that, that trailing print, even though it had been deprecated um, and was no longer viewed as the version of record, still shaped a lot of the thinking about what does a journal article look like. And there are now people, there was a workshop, for example, um, a month or two ago that brought together a number of people interested in scholarly communication called Beyond the PDF which was really looking at ways we might um, represent and communicate scholarly articles differently. So that conversation is, is, is actually, as I perceive it, starting to take off just a little bit now. Um, the same conversation, though, about monographs seems to be stalled. There was a lot of action back, or, um, back 
eight or nine years ago, 10 years ago, um, we had projects like Gutenberg E, for example, that um, uh, Mellon funded working with the American Council of Learned Societies and uh, the American Historical Association trying to get authors to think through um, what would a monograph look like if you had all of the affordances of the digital environment. And those projects were a very mixed success. Um, uh, they produced some very interesting works um, at quite high cost. Um, they took a long time for those works to develop, perhaps because the authors had way too many options and way too many choices. Um, many of the authors found the experience to be both challenging but also sort of exhausting because they felt like writing a monograph was hard enough, inventing the future of the book at the same time off of an almost clean slate was overwhelming for a junior faculty member. Um, there, uh, one of the ideas that, that came out of that was perhaps one could do sort of templated things that provided a compromise between reaching more of the affordances of the digital um, environment on one side, but also um, constraining choice to a manageable level to help the authors, to help the editors, to also help with the preservation of the work might be a way forward. Um, but I, I, I've seen less actual practical um, uh, um, work on that than I might have thought seven or eight years ago. So other than some sort of experimental communities that you know were out there a long time ago and are still out there, but I regard as sort of narrow experimental communities, you know, the people who write interactive fiction and things like that. Um, I, I've not really seen a whole lot of, of um, exploration of how we might intellectually rethink the future of the book um, going on in, in, the, um, in the popular uh, press or in the, um, in the scholarly press arenas over the last few years. That's kind of an interesting development. I would have thought that the monograph would be the right place for that to happen simply because of the scale of effort involved in producing a monograph and um, the relative lack of urgency in completing it when contrasted to journal articles where people are you know, unhappy to do things that will delay it even for a few days getting into the publisher because they're often, at least in the sciences, in a big race to, um, to report results. Um, doesn't seem to be happening right now, at least in the places where I'm looking. Certainly, we are seeing some conventions almost getting established of um, books having websites that go with the books. And those websites actually, in many cases, being um, part of the promotional campaign for the book, um, but in other cases, providing additional um, material that didn't fit in the book. I think actually one could do a very interesting study at this point of um, book and website pairs and the different kinds of websites and the per motivating purposes of those websites that are paired with various kinds of books. Um, uh, but, but we're seeing those kinds of developments rather than rethinking of the book itself. Um, Another thing, though, that is very interesting is um, we're seeing sort of a, sp I, I don't know how to put this um, uh, exactly, but um, we're seeing a bit of a split emerging between books that are produced by the big publishers and where there's still a very clear intent to do books that exist both in the print world and the digital world. So think back, you know, like where we were with the scientific publishers 15 years ago when they were starting to get their toes wet in the digital world. So absolute commitment to parallel publishing for the time being. 
And there they are following very, you know, sort of standard editorial practices about versioning and corrections and things like that. But one thing that has happened economically um, as we've sort of restructured the book market around electronic books is we have seen an enormous rise in self-publishing. Um, again, I, I, I've not seen data that I find terribly believable, but my sense is that probably the number of self-published books out there and readily accessible through channels like Amazon today um, is you know, an order of magnitude bigger than it was five years ago. Um, these folks are publishing only electronically. Uh, some of them are actually making substantial revenue streams. And I should note they come in two flavors. One is um, amateurs who, uh, who never had a publisher and have always self-published. And then occasionally very professional writers who have become irritated with their, um, their publishers for one reason or another and believe it would, it would, their lives would be either more pleasant or more profitable or both if they moved to self-publishing. And we're starting to see a few of them show up as well. But um, one of the things that's remarkable there is that they don't have the same inhibitions about versioning and additioning that the, um, that, that the sort of professional publishing industry does where a new edition or a corrected edition is a big deal. They just number them like software. You know, this is, this is version um, uh, 2.11 of my book. And uh, it just came out last week, you know, and replaced version 2.10. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes they're just cleaning up minor stuff that, editorial, you know, blunders that people reported, typos, spelling, things like that. Other times they're, you know, they didn't like that scene. They'd never liked that scene. They rewrote it and put it out with a better one. And, um, you know, this, this is a very interesting kind of phenomenon um, uh, because you're sort of never sure you're up on an author's work that you're paying attention to. Um, you can have conversations about the same book with someone else, except that it's not really the same book. Um, there's often no organized effort to save the versions or even in some cases to track the changes from version to version. So this is actually an, uh, a, you know, an interesting development that we've not seen much before, except in the world of software and is just sort of cheerfully going forward with nobody paying attention to it. Um, this is one that, um, you know, I, I, I would predict that we will find at least some important writers emerging out of this sort of world of, um, of amateur authorship, of authorship not mediated by the traditional publishing industry, and that there will be a good deal of scrambling around as scholars 20 or 30 years hence try and really understand the emergence and evolution of some of these authors. Um, the good news about some of these authors is that they're really mostly interested in getting read and they're really not terribly interested in things like DRM. They often publish through in, into environments that do not put a lot of DRM constraints on things. And um, that means that collectors can easily collect this material and save it um, in ways that, um, that don't happen easily in highly DRM constrained environments. I mean, Amazon, for example, occasionally sort of does a new edition of a professionally published book. And what they'll do is they'll just push it out to your Kindle, essentially. Um, and, and, you know, quietly update it, or at best they'll send you an email telling you to click here and it will update your copy if you want it updated. Um, so tracking what's happening with this kind of versioning, I think, is, uh, is, is worth paying a little attention to. And it's, it's something that um, 
really has been very alien, mostly in the journal environment, where they've been quite disciplined about it, and in the world of traditional publishers, um, at least in uh, modern times. Um, certainly in um, you know, the early days of, of printing, there was a lot more poorly identified versioning, but um, this seems to be reemerging. So um, those are a couple of, of comments about kind of the, the e-book as, as an intellectual construct. I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, e-books as cultural products and where, where that's fitting. And I think you know, what's really striking here is, is how different this is because it's a consumer market and there's just sort of absolute asymmetry between the um, negotiating power of the big publishers and the big channel providers like Amazon on one side and the consumer on the other, and how differently this is coming out from the much more symmetric negotiations between, for example, research libraries and scholarly publishers during the transition to um, of, of journals to digital form. Um, the notion that a license, for example, needs to include archival provision, that when you license something, um, you have some expectation to be able to use that indefinitely and even use it beyond the demise of a publisher. That was a critical negotiation in the migration of journals to digital form. And basically, I think it was clear to all of the stakeholders um, in that migration, authors, readers, libraries, publishers, that the migration would not happen until we had a credible archiving strategy. Um, because it's ridiculous to talk about a scholarly record that is no record. Um, yet, we seem to have cheerfully thrown this out the window um, for consumer publishing, and really there's no player in the market with enough economic weight to serve as a counterforce. Um, libraries were, are the, were the predominant, and are, the predominant purchasers of scholarly journals. Um, the public, that huge diffuse thing, not you know, public libraries or the library sector or something else, are the, you know, there, there, there is no dominant organized purchaser of um, popular monographs of various kinds. So the only, the only route um, it appears into, um, into thinking about the, the long-term archiving of this cultural record is um, the, the routes th that essentially pass through copyright and copyright deposit to, um, to the Library of Congress. The rest of the library world seems to be largely outside of this conversation right now. Even more disturbing, um, because of all of the digital rights management and, and related stuff that makes it, um, it that, that basically has destroyed the used book market as it applies to um, electronic books, you've cut the role of collectors out. One of the things that we've learned again and again over the past few centuries is that um, collectors, particularly in the you know, early years, play a very, very important role in holding on to cultural heritage as it slowly finds its way into the institutions of society. Um, in fact, you see the whole ecosystem of used book dealers and private collectors feeding very systematically into libraries and archives. And um, you know, we've seen that for lots of different kinds of material and for very long times. This is the first place where it seems like the 
to a first approximation, that whole resale market, that whole collector's kind of world, has been systematically destroyed by leveraging the kind of DRM and license terms that come along with digital works. And while that's annoying on a consumer basis, you know, and certainly you see consumers considering, you know, a value proposition that says, well, I could buy a paper book for $14 and I can either give that away or keep it with pretty high confidence that I can read it for the rest of my life um, or resell it for a few dollars. Um, or I can get an electronic one that, base, that costs a couple dollars less, that has the virtue that I can carry it around very portably and it isn't heavy and it doesn't take up bookshelf space, but that has the negatives that I really, to a first approximation, can't loan it to people. Yes, I know there are some, you know, sort of um, uh, I don't even know what to call them, sort of kabuki loan arrangements um, for, for some of these e-readers, but, um, uh, you know, or maybe Potemkin loan arrangements. Um, uh, but, um, you know, basically I can't loan it, I certainly can't resell it, and, um, you know, hopefully I can read it for some number of years to come if I want to come back to it. That, 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 that's the kind of, you know, balance arrangement people are making now. Um, and, 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 you know, as I say, at, at an individual level, it's annoying and you can kind of make choices one way or another. But if we step back and look at this at a cultural level, when we realize that these e-books aren't getting into library co co um, collections or they're getting in in very, you know, sort of compromised and equivocated ways. Um, you know, this is, this is setting up for a major disaster around the cultural record in the making. And it's one that isn't going to come to fruition for some years as we continue to see dual electronic and, and print publishing, but it's one that I fear really is um, coming before us. Um, I want to touch on just a couple of other things that are going on here. Um, and, you know, there really are, as I say, just almost endless um, uh, developments here that I think deserve exploration for, um, from perspectives that I'm not seeing them get much in the um, in the popular media. Um, one of the other things I'm very struck by, and this is true to a uh, lim uh, more limited sense of music as well, is that um, we're seeing an awfully um, powerful fragmentation of delivery channels. Uh, the notion that as a collecting organization, you can get a good view of what's being published or what's available for acquisition in a market like the United States is getting shakier and shakier um, as you see these exclusive arrangements to single channels of delivery. You see books that are exclusive to specific platforms and specific sellers. There's always been a little bit of that. There's certainly been lots of small specialty publishers who do limited runs of things, but now the permutations between channels and platforms um, are, are, are such that it really is becoming quite complex to, um, to, to, under, to simply understand what's out there. Uh, year to year, what the distribution of this material looks like, what's of interest, um, and, and where you might persistently acquire it. Um, uh, and remember, you don't have the fallback of the kind of collective library system behind you, um, cleaning up after the publishing system. Uh, uh, the notion of going and looking in something like um, you know, OCLC's WorldCat trying to um, understand the publication record of an author um, is, is no longer really giving you the same picture 
uh, that it did even, even 10 years ago. Uh, now you have to start looking in kind of a um, you know, time-dependent way through a wide range of delivery channels, some of them quite small. We're also you know, starting to see abandoned books, um, books that were put out as e-books for specific platforms that go away and are no longer in manufacture. And for some reason, the, the, there really wasn't quite software to migrate it. Um, without the author's cooperation. Maybe there was a obsolete DRM system in the mix in the old platform. Uh, maybe the author lost interest. Uh, maybe the author doesn't even know where their you know, current sort of files that could be reformatted formatted out to a new platform is. Um, so we're actually starting to see, and this is again a phenomenon in um, books, that is almost without precedent, um, uh, you know, books that are orphaned for technological reasons. Um, I, I have to say that I'm sort of waiting half fearfully for the first great, you know, technology orphaning to occur because right now the standards are weak enough and the DRM and multiple enough and the um, DRM systems are still problematic enough, I could readily believe that um, uh, some platform could, go, could be discontinued and we could suddenly find people with substantial bodies of books that they, they can't read. Um, it's, it's interesting to me to see that the music industry has been sort of slowly and quietly pulling back from this over the last few years. Um, uh, in the sense that they are doing a lot less DRM than they used to. So in fact, um, you're starting to see a reasonable amount of interoperability among purchased digital music from multiple sources and multiple channels. Probably more so, I would say now, than um, you, are, you are actually for books, interestingly enough. Um, so, um, uh, at least to my eye, books are, are starting to surface as the place we could actually see um, larger collections of, of technologically you know, orphaned materials uh, that people have spent a good deal of money on surfacing. Um, I think that's a, that's a development that bears, um, that, that bears careful watching. Um, I'm not going to say anything much about um, the issues involved in licensing um, uh, popular books into uh, public libraries. I mean, I, I think things are fairly clear there. The libraries ideally would like to be able to, um, well, ideally they'd like to be able to license it just like a book and do unlimited concurrent usage. Um, I think that they would settle for um, something that emulates the behavior of a print book with one use at a time serially. Um, I think that the, many of the publishers are looking at this as a situation where they would like to see some per use charge, essentially per circulation charge. And the question is just whether they want to see that as a ongoing charge, you know, um, metered every time it goes out, or prepaid in some estimated way, like this um, book that circulates 26 times and self-destructs. Um, uh, until, until we figure out where or if there is a meeting ground between those models, um, uh, I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be very difficult um, to, uh, to expect to see large numbers of, of popular books finding their way into um, uh, circulating library collections. Now this is, uh, it's worth saying that um, this is something that I think the research library, this is a battle the research libraries have largely left to the public libraries to fight right now. 
um, in part because I believe they think that because their user communities are better scoped and more limited, um, that they will be able to cut satisfactory license deals. Um, but um, I haven't seen much uh, actual cutting of such deals for popular materials. And there are a lot of popular materials that research libraries are going to need. And then at the nonfiction level, you know, that, that sort of dividing line between scholarly and non-scholarly is anything but clear in many disciplines. And uh, even the things that are non-scholarly are often vital raw material for the next generation of, of scholarly inquiry. Um, certainly when we talk about other parts of the cultural record, um, the fact that, you know, um, it, it's literature or fiction or something like that makes no difference. It's part of the cultural record and part of the ongoing body of material that scholars study. Um, so I don't, I, I think that um, we ignore some of these developments in the, in the academy um, at, at considerable peril. Um, and um, perhaps should be thinking a little bit more about how the needs of the research library world are going to connect up with some of the problems that public libraries are facing right now. As far as the economics go, um, as I said, I don't want to go deeply into there, but I do think what we're seeing implicitly are a set of conversations about what's a book worth, what's the clear ability to keep a preservation copy and um, to have a, a loanable copy of a book worth. Um, we're actually, you know, kind of conducting a experiment in the consumer market around that, um, except it's an, it's an experiment with funny constraints. If you want the archival and, and circulatable one, you're going to have to go with paper in most cases. Um, and yet there is a, a sort of a parallel campaign to demonize paper as, you know, obsolete and only old people use paper and, um, you know, the, the world uh, that's zooming ahead and, and leaving places like libraries behind is all about electronic reading. Um, it's interesting that that, you know, sort of public relations campaign is going on without much evidence that um, those new e-books are really using any of the affordances of the digital environment right now other than, um, uh, you know, sort of portability and rendering on screen. I mean, they're the, they're the most meager of the, um, uh, of the potential um, uh, affordances that are available. But that's, that, that's the way that's being set up right now. Um, we're, we're not seeing a lot of bookstores anymore. Um, I don't know, uh, you know when, the, uh, when the last time you saw one that didn't have a closing, everything must go kind of sign in the window. Um, but uh, they, they clearly have become, in a not very long period, a highly, um, you know, endangered species. Uh, that it really didn't take very long. Um, this, was, this was almost a non-issue 10 years ago when I, I was writing that piece. And now, um, really, they're, they're, almost, um, they're, they're almost gone from the world. It's, it's very striking. Um, yet we've seen the growth, which I, I'm not sure was widely predicted, not of lots of um, sales points for electronic works, but of a few rather monolithic stores. Um, Amazon, the, um, the Apple uh, bookstore, um, the Barnes & Noble bookstore, um, there, there, really, there, there are a number of small players around there, but much more concentration, I think, than, than people would have expected 10 years ago. Um, and, and yet, um, 
and, and this, is, this will be my final point. Um, one of the things that is very interesting to me about this concentration is that it's somehow made for a much less transparent market. We used to have really pretty good data about the book market. And now we have these rather proprietary marketing channels where it's quite difficult to get data about what's being sold um, in detail, what's on offer, um, how that is changing year to year. I mean, they're, they're very selective and self-interested in the, in the data that they release. And it's actually, I think, become significantly harder than it was um, 10 years ago to really understand um, in a, in a data-driven way rather than an anecdotal way many of the dynamics of this marketplace. Um, and, and that's an area that, that probably also bears some thinking about. So I've been going on for a long time. Nobody's interrupted me. Um, I'm most of the way through the list of things that I wanted to touch on, recognizing how limited our time was and how many uh, different ideas I wanted to sort of put out in circulation about what's happening in the ebook market. Um, I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause and invite some questions, comments, challenges, corrections. Uh, or other things from the audience. Um, they are recording this, so you might want to grab the mic. Sir. David Carlson from SIU Carbondale. Um, two observations, one sort of in the cultural and one in the intellectual piece. One is it's sort of my observation that just as we see students, and in many cases faculty, limit themselves in their choice of what they uh, read or research to availability of full text. I think we're starting to see that too in, in, in the book world, so that if you're, if you're a diehard Kindle guy or gal, mm -hmm. um, and it's not available on the Kindle, you move on, yep. unless it's really compelling, you know, unless it's the Harry yep. Potter thing or, or, or whatever else. Um, so I'd like your comments on that. And, and, and secondly, the other thing I didn't hear you talk about, but I, but I think is occurring, um, is, the, is the apparent increasing nature of new forms of content, and I refer in particular to, the, to Amazon's shingle uh, platform, whereby it's, it's not an essay, it's, it's not a blog posting, but it's not a book. It's in the uh, 100, 200 page, mm -hmm. if we had pages kind of realm. Um, that, um, and there are two elements of this. One, of course, is the length, but the other, the other piece of this that I think is interesting is it's about the distributor acting in a way as publisher, giving an imprimatur to it. So just your comment. Um, two wonderful questions. Uh, we are starting to see that phenomenon. You know, it's exactly the same one we used to see about if it's not online, you know, if I can't get it online right now, it may as well not exist. Um, we're seeing that now for certain kinds of books and certain kinds of readers. You know, they're interested in what they can get on their e-reader, and uh, if not, unless it's something very special, they're just not going to bother with it. Um, right now, I think the market is fragmented enough, and most people have kind of a favorite e-reader, that um, we're, we're not quite seeing that. Um, become a, a heavily self-reinforcing thing yet. Um, that, uh, you know, oh, I can't get this for my Kindle, um, doesn't, doesn't put the author and the publisher that have made the choice not to make it available at that at quite enough risk yet to be excruciating, um, especially if they've made an exclusive with uh, Nook or with, um, with something else. I think we're very close to that point, though. And um, again, I, I, this is something that the publishers have data on. Um, we, we know for, or they know, what the impact is of, or, or at least in specific cases, of deciding, for example, 
I'm going to put books out only in paper first, and then six months later, when I do the paperback release, I'll put it out priced like a paperback for an e-reader, as opposed to um, I'll put it out in parallel with the hard copy edition, and I'll put it out priced like a discounted hard copy. Uh, hard, uh, I'm sorry, discounted hardback. Um, uh, most of that data um, doesn't get public yet. Uh, but I, I, I do feel like something is, you know, we're creeping up to, a, to an inflection point there. A as far as the short essays, I've been very intrigued by that phenomenon. You know, basically it's sort of almost impossible to publish a 100-page book um, unless you're somebody fairly special in print. Um, uh, and now people are doing this fairly casually. Um, onto book readers, typically, you know, priced for a couple of bucks, long short stories, lengthy essays, things like that, that didn't have good venues before. Um, I, I think this is actually a very nice and kind of unexpected side development, and it's one where I think mostly, Mostly you're seeing established writers do it at this point, um, uh, perhaps because people are more willing to try one of these if they recognize the author's name. Um, but I think, that, I, I think that as they become more commonplace, um, this will sort of reemerge as, a, as a, a legitimate genre for a lot of people, and I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, there are an awful lot of books that really don't, shouldn't take more than 100 pages and are excruciatingly padded to 250 to make a hardback. David. Uh, David Rosenthal from Stanford. Um, two quick points. The first is that um, a couple of years ago, Mike Keller established a policy that said for all kinds of electronic resources, journals, books, everything, uh, any agreement that didn't get Stanford a copy that they could keep and, and use required his signature. And that's actually, that level of pushback has actually been quite effective. Um, the other one is, anybody who's interested in this area should be reading the fascinating discussion that's going on on Joe Conrad's blog between Joe, uh, John Lott, uh, Barry Eisler, and a bunch of other oh, yeah. authors who are um, self-publishing on Kindle because what this uh, on Amazon because what this illustrates is that in some sense the big effect of ebooks has been because they have a different and much more efficient distribution channel. Uh, uh, when they uh, when Joe wrote the first blog post, John Locke held the number one, number four, number ten, and three other books in the top forty on Amazon. Uh, Joe had the number 35. Um, the reason was they had dropped the price to 99 cents a book. At 99 cents a book, Amazon gives them 35 cents. That's a bigger proportion of the total purchase price than they would ever get from a print legacy publisher, even for an ebook. <laughs> John uh, Locke was making $1,800 a day in 99 cent downloads. 99 cents is the price of a book. And that is going to be transformative. There is no future for book publishers um, in pricing at $10 or things like that. This is an argument between the, the intellectual property owners and the public uh, and their customers about the value of the thing they're trying to sell. Retailers know the customer is always right. And, and this is, I mean, you know, forget bookstores. Um, most of the big publishers are going away because they can't exist at 99 cents a book. And the other big thing about it is that the, the, the reason that these guys are making so much money is that their backlist stays in production. And they're making this money not from the books that they published, that they, they got out there in the last year or so. They're making it from books they wrote 10, 12 years ago. I, I definitely commend that series of blog posts, which I came across um, a, a couple weeks ago myself. It's very interesting to, see, to hear 
authors with a real financial stake in this. Um, uh, you know, people who've been earning a living and a pretty good living as authors. And those are few and far between, by the way. You know, one of the, one of the things that's happened in the marketplace over the last 20 years is that there are a few authors who make a very good living. There are a lot of authors who do it for love and or, for, or as an adjunct to other ways of earning a living. And then there's not much left in the middle. Um, uh, so these kinds of conversations are really interesting. I, I think the jury is still out on whether books are going to, all books are going to end up costing 99 cents, but we're already seeing an awful lot of books out there for 99 cents. And that's a really interesting phenomenon and seeing the kind of volume that, that David is talking about offsetting that is uh, also fascinating. Um, I, I, I still, though, you know, really worry um, uh, greatly about um, uh, the, the sort of archival issues about these flows. Um, uh, you know, they're putting it in the hands of authors that doesn't, believe it or not, make me feel that much better than putting it in the hands of publishers. Um, authors are, are actually, you know, very fragile holders of their works in many ways. Um, George will give you the last comment. George Strawn, NSF and the NIDR Interagency Program. Cliff, you've uh, told us a lot of interesting things about e-books and you've mentioned uh, e-music and we also know there are e-movies and e-games. Give us your prediction that we can come back in 10 years and check you on for the merger of these formats now that you can. Um, the merger of these formats, well, certainly we've seen a, um, you know, just as we've seen a very complicated evolution of the, um, of the market for books and for music, that's also happening in video, although that, that situation is even more richly complicated because it started not from one place, but from two places. Um, one, one place was television and broadcast television, and the other was movies. And so, um, you know, you, you've really had two systems kind of evolving and, and largely merging with each other in hideously complicated ways. Um, I think that um, we're already seeing convergence there. I mean, um, you're, you're seeing the same channels marketing music, marketing, um, marketing digital music, digital um, uh, videos, um, and uh, electronic books. You're seeing, in many cases, platforms that increasingly can handle all of these. Um, not in all cases. Uh, um, Book-specific platforms seem to be a special kind of holdout, but I, you know, my guess is that things like the iPad will, um, uh, you know, will will really move the idea of converged um, converged platforms uh, ahead. Yeah. Um, Well, uh, okay, so, so that's the platform side. Now, you know, actually there is some crossover here, but it's almost always bad. You know, there are, there are bad novelizations of movies, there are bad movies from novels, there are, um, you know, dubious games derived from, um, from novel series and things like that. <laughs> Um, I, I guess my sense is that you can probably do this now if you want to, but um, uh, I, I don't personally, I personally can't point to anyone who's sort of gone out and brought all of these things together in a, in a holistic way that's, um, that really works. Um, uh, you know, that, that as, a, as a work of communication or a, of art is 
greater as a whole than, than its individual components in a substantial way. I think you, you probably are going to see more experiments in that area. Um, uh, certainly, there's, um, there's interesting back and forth between um, video games and movies in various ways. Um, uh, but how long before you get a wide range of offerings like that that are really exciting, um, I wouldn't want to predict. I guess I, uh, the scale of investment is such that, um, you know, to really come out with a portfolio of these things that um, uh, they almost tend to be franchises. Um, you know, think again of Harry Potter. Right, you know, there you, you've got what um, seven books, eight movies, um, uh, some kind of um, theme park. Um, uh, I'm sure there are half a dozen licensed video games derived from it. Um, uh, but I'm, uh, you know, the, the 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 more extended this franchise gets, I guess I. I wonder how interesting some of the stuff on the fringes are. It's a great question, though, um, and, and one that, that probably um, uh, really bears some watching. I think we're probably past time and supposed to be headed to lunch. Um, thanks for, uh, for joining me for this. I hope that it's given you a couple of new angles on some of the things that are going on in the uh, in the ebook market, and um, as you know, we all explore this strange landscape further. Um, I'd love it if you send along interesting discoveries. Thank you. <laughs>